the king, and he's invited, and we welcome him in. We can't have church if he doesn't come in. Will you help me praise the Lord and tell him thank you? Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Bless your name. Fill this room with your presence. Let your anointing fall. Let your word go forth with authority and power. Take self out of the way. Let nothing be seen but your authority, your word, your deliverance in the word. And God will give you glory. And I know you'll help me praise the Lord and tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We celebrate you, God. We celebrate you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Ah, we ask that God will ignite us and excite us and send us home a different way than we came. Ah, I am thankful for this great opportunity. It is always a high privilege to have this honor to speak to God's people at any time. But in this moment and in this place, it is remarkable, it is humbling, it is terrifying at the same time. And I thank those persons who made this moment possible. I want to first give honor to God and the spirit of the Lord that is in this place and he's been present with us this week. We give honor to our leaders, even in their absence, we honor their presence. Bishop C.E. Blake, the first assistant presiding bishop, Bishop P.A. Brooks, the second assistant, Bishop J.W. Macklin, the entire general board, to all of the leaders and bishops who head this great church, to Bishop Whitehead, who graciously extended this invitation, I thank you, and I appreciate the years of friendship. To our esteemed women in the women's department, Mother Rivers, Lady Mae Blake, the assistant supervisor, Dr. Barbara Lewis, our assistant marshal, Dr. Juliet White, my own supervisor, Mother Emily Myrick, my pastor and his wife, Dr. J. Lewis and Lady Priscilla Felton, thank you for your support. To my husband, to my chief supporter, to my bishop, to my enabler of every effort in ministry, the Bishop Ernest C. Morris Sr., I'm sure he's here, and I, ap I appreciate you for your unconditional support and your encouragement of my every effort. And I take pleasure in publicly saying thank you, dear. And now to the moment, the word of God. Our assignment was to provide a doctrinal message to this vast audience, which includes all levels of ministry, their teachers, their preachers, their evangelists, their worship leaders, their auxiliary heads, their credential holders from all over the country, and indeed, their delegates' presence from all around the world. For me, doctrine refers to that body of beliefs that define and govern our faith and practice. Simply stated, we believe the Bible to be the only infallible written word of God. And this is the fundamental tenet of our belief system, our doctrine, if you will. And it posits that every man, every woman, every boy, every girl has the right to, has the obligation to, has the privilege to, has the necessity to forge their individual relationship to God through his son, Jesus Christ. Everyone must have that existential moment before God to say yes to God and receive or reject his power into and over their life. And following that moment, a lifetime where lifestyle, values, behavior, commitment consistently reflect that single moment of choice where the individual starts to grow stronger in faith, become more committed in duty, more faithful in service, and more dedicated in pursuing an effective role in furthering the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, the corporate structure that embraces and empowers all of these efforts is the organism of the church. And this is the method, the institution, the organization that God created to present the gospel, to nurture converts, 
to inculcate our children as they grow and to train and equip the body of Christ to go into all the world and make disciples as mandated by the Great Commission of Christ. That's the easy part and that's the good news. However, even a brief glance at the church as it exists in the modern world shows how far from God's standard we have drifted. So today, I'd like to look at a very familiar passage of scripture that recently just leaped out at me in a completely different way. And I'd like to share that with you. And perhaps at the conclusion of this time, we could explore a challenge that we could possibly consider together. I'd like to talk to you today about Isaiah, the sixth chapter, verses one through eight. I'm not gifted with giving titles to things, so as you go home and think about the message, perhaps you can send me some suggestions on what I could call it. But I had just sort of standing in his presence. Here we go. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Now, Let's look at the setting, the people involved, and the background, and see what we can learn from this magnificent passage of scripture. We know that the prophet Isaiah was a member of the royal family. He was related to King Uzziah. Now, Uzziah had become king as a very young man, a teenager, just 16 years old on the death of his father. He was successful in battles. He strengthened his kingdom and demonstrated real leadership and governing ability. But by the end of his life, got bit by the success bug. When our text takes place, he had strayed far from the Lord. The prophet Zechariah had died, and Zechariah had held a great positive influence on the king while he lived. But later in his life, when success, when he was successful, when his influence with the public grew and his power among the other crowned heads around him grew and increased and he was successful, Uzziah then became proud of himself and in himself and he usurped the authority of the priests. He no longer sought the Lord in his decision making. And he began going into the temple to burn the sacred incense, which was a function to be done only by the priests. Knowing that this was a dangerous affront to God, the high priest Azariah and 80 other priests banded together, risked their lives to go to the king and try to reason with him, to plead with him, not to step out of his lane, but to step, not to step into the realm of the sacred, but to continue to concern himself only with the legal and economic and political and military and governing issues of the state. But he would not hear it. 
who continue to intrude into the worship practices and spiritual matters under the authority of the priesthood. And when he refused to listen, he was stricken with leprosy and it stayed with him for the rest of his life. Our text opens with the famous and familiar phrase, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Read this text all of my life, but this happened at a particular time in the life of the nation of Israel, a time not unlike where we are right now, a time of insecurity, a time of unrest and uncertainty, where prevalent and where the leadership of the nation was in flux. It was a question of how and who and why the country would be governed and by whom. But let's look more deeply at the setting of this text and figure out what that setting is saying to us and how Isaiah's response to what he saw might be instructive for us today. Now, since we're Americans and modern day Americans at that, we have no frame of reference when the text speaks of a king and of the protocol and of the trappings and of the surroundings of a kingship, what it looked like, what it symbolized, what it meant. But in Isaiah's time, a king would have a very grand scale indeed and would live on a very grand scale indeed. You can see that in the ancient castles and palaces of Europe in Asia, as you go to visit them, you can see the grandeur of great high dome ceilings. And these are covered with tapestries and paintings. You can see the great throne room with beautifully carved fragrant wood thrones and hammered gold and silver ornaments. You see the colorful carpets and antique rugs. And because the king could afford every luxury, beautiful fine garments. Every luxury was afforded for him. Sheer curtains and hangings which would make the throne room a place of awe-inspiring grandeur. Isaiah was used to being a part of the court. He had access to the very throne room of Isaiah. And it says Isaiah was a member of that society. And he was already a prophet. He had already been called, but he was not focused on his calling. He was a prophet, but he was not faithful to his purpose. He was a prophet and he had the job and the title, but he was not focused. He was not reverent. He was not dedicated to what God had called him to. What are you talking about, Sister Morris? He could only see the glamour. He could only see the power. He could only see the politics. He could only see the prestige. He could only see the social status of being a part of that inner circle of the court that surrounded a powerful king. He was in the school of the prophets. He may have been the head of the school of the prophets, but he didn't value that. He was focused on political power, but not God's power. What are you talking about, Sister Morris? He was just appointed a prophet, but he was not anointed a prophet. Oh, <laughs> I can prove it in just a moment. Just take us. So many in ministry today, so many who don't value the small church experience, but I come from the storefront experience that's familiar in the church of God in Christ. Despise not the day of small things because so many of us are strong and have strong roots because of the authentic worship and effective teaching and sincere sacrificial living that we were taught in those small local churches but Isaiah was focused on the dazzling splendor of Uzziah's court. And this text shows us that because it says in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, also the Lord. The Lord is an also. The word also leaped off the page at me. It shows us clearly that Isaiah was still focused on Uzziah as God. And God, the Elohim of creation, and God, the all-powerful El Shaddai, the creator God who spoke all things to existence, who is worthy of all worship, all honor, all glory, all praise, is reduced to an also in Isaiah's eyes. He is still primarily focused 
on even the dead king, even the dead king is still takes precedence over the living God. He is dazzled by the exquisite throne room of an earthly king, so that when he gets his glimpse of the throne room of God, his reaction is still to put God in second place. He reduces God to being, I saw also the Lord. Mm. The text says clearly, I only saw also, because I was still looking at the king. How significant this observation is for us. Beware, saints. You can't have two focal points. You can't have divided vision. You can't have two thrones in your spirit. Uzziah is dead. We took him out of our hearts, took him out of our minds, our spirits, when we said yes to the Lord. We pulled down the monuments we had set up in our lives, whatever those persons or things were or are that share our attention and keep us from focusing 100% totally on God. Isaiah's honesty is instructive for us. It is subtle. We are fooled because we really want to love and respect and appreciate the people in our lives whom we admire and who have helped us but beware, lest that person, that accomplishment, that position, that promotion, that elevation, that title, that whatever it is that makes God an also in your life, I believe it will change us. It will change our level of commitment. It will transform us if we can just fully understand how that one word also shut out a warning to us. Isaiah says, in the year that my idol died, then I also saw the Lord. The description that follows has to be analyzed in detail. That has to be analyzed in detail. He was commissioned, he was appointed, he was working in his office and operating in his calling, but think of it, the prophet, the major prophet, had never seen God. I'm going to let that Selah moment sink in. I saw also the Lord because until that moment I was still looking at King Uzziah. Ask yourself, who is your Uzziah? What is your Uzziah? What has divided your attention from God? Now let's see what about Isaiah saw that changed his life forever. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The court of our glorious God, the heavenly king, dazzled Isaiah because he was used to Uzziah's palace, and perhaps it had a high dome ceiling, grand for an earthly king, but can you let your imagination soar to the heights of the throne room of God? Can you picture the literally heavenly star-studded ceiling of God's throne room? Oh, where the curtains are not silk and tapestry, but where the fabric is actually made out of actual rainbows. Ha, ah, where the blue is not the pale colors of the earthly palette or paint, but where the colors of the sunset, the vibrant vermilions and crimsons and golds are from the sunset, where the cobalt blue is of the evening sky, and where the pale blue is where the dawn is just breaking. Oh, where the light is the dazzling sunshine from the orb of the sun that makes everything in the throne room glow with a golden light. Can you imagine the throne of God? Can you picture the stones and the precious jewels and the gems that are mentioned in the book of Revelation that make up the 12 gates to the city, the clear, brilliant diamond or the chrysolite? Can you, can you see the 
the jasper and the sardonyx, the pearl and the pale blue chalcedony, emeralds and rubies and sapphires. It says that his train filled the whole temple. We assume this means the tail of his garment, but that is not, that's only one definition of a train. I believe that Isaiah saw was what he used to sing in the earthly court of King Uzziah. A train refers to the servants, to the courtiers, to the messengers, to the servants, to the ambassadors, to the crowds of people that crowd into the throne room of a king. Their people are coming to get a hearing or help from the king. It is the retinue who travel with the king. It is his posse, if you will. It is his entourage, if you will. That is the train that he saw. They follow the king, make way for him, and move quickly and safely among his subjects. The natural throne room is filled with people and everybody there has to give honor to the king, serve the king, help the king, seek from the king their, their justice. They're seeking help and assistance from the king. They're trying to get a request heard. They're trying to get their grievance listened to. They're trying to get a sentence commuted. They're trying to get their fines reduced. They're trying to get justice when you've been mistreated or taken advantage of. They're trying to get their conviction overturned. They're trying to get their death penalty pardoned. They're trying to get their record expunged. Trying to get their property tax reduced. Oh, God have mercy. They're trying to get their adversary stopped. All of these are the benefits if you're just allowed to get into the throne room of the king. My God, my God, my God. And there are ministers and government workers and offices of the military, tax experts, lawyers, judges, financialists. That's the train that Isaiah saw that filled the temple, and that's in the natural king. You need, as a citizen, everything that you need is in the audience room of the throne room of the king. It helps you to secure the victory if you can just get into the presence of the king. Ah, Isaiah knew all of this, but when he got a glimpse of the throne room of God, he was blown away because these are not little government officials. These are not little hand-paid flunkies trying to get a job done. No, the train that filled the temple that he saw were glorious, supernatural, Heavenly beings, angels and archangels, seraphims and cherubims, supernatural messengers who were vying one against the other to do the will and the work of the master. Here I am, God, send me. Here I am, God, I'll go. Here I am, God, let me do it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He saw how weak and puny and ineffective and how in need of help Isaiah's court was compared to the speed, the power, the authority of even one of the beings that surrounded God. And they led their fellows in worship like the young woman did today. And they were crying, holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah! We're still a holiness church. It's still our doctrine. We still believe you got to say Jesus, 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 Jesus until he comes, until he transforms you from the inside out. That's doctrine. So whatever you need, we can dispatch a seraphim, an angel, to get you the help you need. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now here we go. It said even the doorposts moved at just the voice of one of these angels. And his voice was an earthquake because the pillars got shook out of their places by the reverberation of the voice of one angel. And Jesus said, I could presently send to my daddy, and he'd send me 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You do the math. I can't. 
and you're putting Uzziah up against God and tell me you also saw God? But we do it every day. Think about it. And he had never seen power. He said his voice, he said, and then there was smoke that filled the whole throne room. That means his voice was like a volcano. The eruption just put smoke and fire all over the throne room of God. And God wasn't scared. You've never seen authority. Isaiah had never seen holiness. He'd never seen royalty. He'd never seen worthiness that is worthy to be worshipped. It is so much superior to any earthly king. And he saw how foolish it was to think Isaiah was great when even a servant of God was greater than the greatest in Isaiah's court. And his response, when he realized what he had wasted, of his opportunity to serve that God, <sighs> that he had magnified the creature and minimized the creator. And he knows that he's standing in a very dangerous spot. And he knows that he stands, in fact, in a place of judgment. And he says, woe is me. I am undone. And he's guilty of missing my calling. I'm guilty of missing God. When you leave here, don't go home with another hat box and having missed God. Ah. <laughs> Time's winding up, folks. We ain't got time to play with this. He said, I'm a man of unclean limbs because I have spoken error. I have praised the king, and the only true king is Jehovah. I failed even to teach or to preach truth. The people are no different than I am. I never improved the people because I was in the same boat as they were. Don't you know if you're called to the priesthood, you can't be the same as the people you lead. You better have a higher level of consecration. You better have a closer walk. You can't play in the games, in the mess, and then think you can just jump into the pulpit on Sunday morning and be anointed. Oh, no, no. The anointing has lifted. You got to live it to preach it. Now I got it right, he says. I see what I was unable to see because I had the wrong person on the throne. I'm almost finished. And now mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord, ah, and the Lord of hosts. And he begins to worship, and God gives him a second chance. And now he is called again. Now, as Isaiah has a call to work, a call to ministry, he has a call to reach the world. Now I can go in power. Now I can walk in my anointing. Isaiah said, I can be effective now. Because now when the question is asked, who will go for us and who shall I send? He said, I'm cleaned up now. I got my vision clear. I see who the God of the universe is. It ain't poor Isaiah. It's too late to pray for him. He's already gone. But thank you, God, for giving me a second chance. Here am I. Send me. Cancel your agenda. Rewrite your playbook. Get yourself a new itinerary. Get a new assignment. Write yourself a new job description. You got to get a new vision. You got to get your priorities straight. You got to have a new agenda. You got to put yourself on God's agenda. Check your vision. Who is confusing your vision? If you can't see, you got to get your focus right. Hallelujah. You can't be useful to God if you see things 
You can't be useful to God if you see promotion, if you see office, if you see title, if you see power, if you see wealth, if you see status, if you see a 47th Psalm raised on your behalf. You haven't seen God. Take another look at the throne room. It's a personal. Hallelujah. You got to have church growth. As your no, you can't have church growth as your ambition. You gotta have salvation of souls. There's a place of self-awareness, a place of repentance. You gotta put yourself there. Nobody knows you but you. You've gotta have a place of purging, and that's what the live coal did. It burned out the impurities in Isaiah and let him be pure. So the words he spoke would have anointing and power. Can't come from an unclean well. You've got to have that purged. In the name of Jesus, you've got to go to a place of surrender, a place of engagement, a place of involvement, a place of commitment. You've got to see God as God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Clean up your vision, take another look, and see God. <laughs> 